Infrastructure Renewal in China. Uh, Professor Little is a senior fellow in the Price School and he's the former director of the USC Keston Institute for Public Finance and Infrastructure Policy. His research and teaching focuses on critical infrastructure I issues and he has over 40 years experience in planning, management, and policy development relating to civil infrastructure. Prior to joining USC, he was the director of the Board on Infrastructure and the Constructed Environment of the National Research Council. So we look very forward to learning about more civil infrastructure. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to have the opportunity to come and talk to you all, although I hate to speak in rooms that are modeled on the Roman Colosseum. It, it gives one a certain uh, sense of vulnerability being down here. If you don't like it and throw things, they'll all get down to the bottom. Uh, but this is, uh, the idea of sustainability applied to funding is one that uh, you may not typically think about we, when we talk about sustainability we think in terms of resources and will the the future have enough to go on and we generally think in in terms of natural resources water clean air food what have you but being that in the area of infrastructure and probably more importantly public services which is what infrastructure is all about uh, the, the fuel for infrastructure, if you will, is mostly money and uh, how you raise it, how you spend it, what you spend it on are all really important uh, issues. And of course, China uh, has undergone profound changes in the past 30 years, really beginning with uh, the very late 1970s. Uh, up through the present, the, the transformation of China economically, physically, uh, has been dramatic. And obviously, uh, looking at, at the attendees, many of you know this far better th than I do. And uh, there's you know, certainly a lot of talk about the, the Chinese miracle on, on many fronts. And, uh, a lot of this has to do with infrastructure. They have high-speed rail, they have brand new airports and seaports, uh, very much uh, state-of-the-art systems, which is not surprising. They're all uh, relatively new. Uh, however, one of the questions that is not asked nearly uh, as often as it should be is, what do we do when these systems get old, which is where certainly the U.S. is now. Uh, much of the de developed world, if you, if you think about Europe, even though most of Europe wa was devastated by the Second World War, uh, you know, rebuilding was pretty much complete by the late 1950s, early 1960s. So even those systems are, are now 50 years old, and, and how, do we, how do we put mechanisms in place to make sure that these systems can go on in perpetuity, and, and that, again, there's enough resources available to do this. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, based on a paper that I gave, and I'll have to read this because try as I might, I can't remember uh, all the words. This was at the um, 2011 Conference of the Academic Committee of Foreign Studies in Urban Planning of the Urban Planning Society of China. That's why I couldn't remember that. 
Uh, that was in Tianjin uh, last November, and uh, there's some focus uh, in the presentation on uh, Tianjin because it's an interesting uh, city for those of you who aren't as familiar uh, with China. Tianjin is the seaport that is really, uh, for all intents and purposes, the eastern sort of end of the Beijing Tianjin uh, urban agglomeration, if you will. There's some 25 million people living in those two places. It is connected with high-speed rail, which actually works quite well, and the trains are always full. But uh, Tianjin was an older city that has been, uh, as many Chinese cities has, has been rebuilt, and it's, uh, I'll show you, Re re redevelopment in, in China sort of takes on a, a whole different scale, like many things that go on. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's happened in China, both from the standpoint of growth, uh, tax policy, uh, what's going on there now and what's proposed, and, and how this relates to some things that we do uh, in the U.S. So without further ado, and I'll stand, I'll try to, I, well, I hate this room, I can never figure out where to stand. But uh, as I mentioned, not only has China's overall growth uh, been very large, there's uh, well over a billion people, but the, the rate of urbanization going back 1980, right at the end of the Cultural Revolution, only about 20% of the population was considered urbanized. That it's about 50%, a little over 50% today, and this is projected by 2050 to grow to 70%. And even those of you who aren't good in math can figure out that 70% of a very big number is a very big number. Uh, just this little growth in increment between 2009 and 2050, that's 425 million people. That's the population of the U.S. plus another 100 million or so thrown in for good measure. That's a lot of people moving to the cities. Th those aren't all new residents. One of the very interesting things that I find about China, and I, I'm certainly... Uh, certainly not an expert on all things Chinese, but the, the growth strategy is one of urbanization. China uh, went from being a very poor, very undeveloped nation to certainly a much wealthier nation and, and much development, but much of the population still resides away from the eastern portion of the country. Uh, Guangzhou, Gudang Province, the area around Shanghai, Beijing. These are all eastern cities. As you move out to the west, there's much less development, and there's certainly much more uh, inequality in income. Most of the income is concentrated in the eastern portion. Uh, and the authorities in, Chinese rea in China realize that they need to maintain a reason to go to the cities where people can, in fact, because of all the, the reasons cities exist, uh, better themselves economically, better themselves financially, in many cases, uh, establish new lives. So th there needs to be a way to support people. There needs to be infrastructure to move them around. There need to be revenue streams. So that is a great challenge, and this is a very simplified model uh, of urban growth. And if you go back to the, the previous graph that, well, this is occurring. And of course, if you keep moving people to the city, uh, if you keep the boundaries intact, the city becomes much more dense and that's not realistic. So what you have is the, the urban boundary expands and the way that's occurred uh, is by the cities annexing land from the countryside. And, and that's, that's a whole other uh, lecture and conversation. But the, the cities are continuously annexing land uh, 
for real estate development, basically. It, it's kind of an old value add uh, sort of ploy, if you will, that uh, land that's suitable for urban development is a great deal more valuable than land that's being used for agriculture. So the value of the real estate goes up immeasurably. Uh, on the basis of that increase in value, uh, and I'll get to this a little bit later, there is no, there's no, what we have in, in the states, a municipal bond market. There are no public debt issuances that go out for uh, tender to institutions or the general public. So basically, money is borrowed from Chinese banks against the assumed appreciation and value of the real estate, that money is then used to develop infrastructure, whether for transport or power, water, and sanitation. And of course, this then goes back and continues to fuel the cycle. And the very big cities in China continue to get bigger. But more interestingly, the mid-sized cities in China Many of them are moving into, if not megacity status, they're certainly getting bigger as well. The question is, uh, can you sustain this? Uh, I'll show a sign of enormous age here and, and local knowledge, but uh, the uh, commentator Will Rogers said many, many years ago that we should always invest in land because they're not making any more of it. Uh, which, with some exceptions, is true. So if you have this growth strategy that's based on continuously annexing land, eventually you're going to run out of land. Eventually, the boundary of Beijing will run into the boundary of Tianjin. And then where, in fact, do you go? So there are limits on this. And this has raised uh, some concern about just the overall sustainability of this particular strategy. Uh, after the Cultural Revolution ended and uh, there were conscious efforts on the part of many to modernize China, one of the first things that were done was to reform the tax system. Now that's, again, that's probably another two or three lectures at another time. But one of the underlying things was the tax reform shifted more revenue to the central government, but, and this is not unique to China, responsibility for doing infrastructure was given to the local authorities. Now, as I said, the local authorities have no authority to, in fact, issue bonds and, and borrow money, so they also have less money to do more, which, again, we see that in all our conversations about governance in the US. There's, we want to do more, but there's less to do it with. Uh, so a lot of borrowing went on for infrastructure. Nothing unusual about that. Most uh, infrastructure is, in fact, built through borrowed money, whether through bonds or other forms. Uh, and these were generally in the form of bank loans. Remember that we're talking about the, mostly the four big Chinese banks, which are in fact owned by the state, loaning money to these entities called Urban Development Investment Corporation, UDICs. Uh, that was the primary source of, of debt financing. And, and what has occurred over time is these are not long-term loans. Typically, in the US, if a municipality or a state issues uh, bonds to do infrastructure, it'll be for 20 or 30 years, fairly long period of time. These bank loans roll over uh, much more quickly than that, so they basically have to be renegotiated. And uh, again, this terms change and uh, there's a lot of churn on, on the part of this. And the question is, you know, what is the, the real value of the land? Because all the borrowing is 
against one of two things. Either it's against the land itself, or it's against the revenue potential of a particular facility, say a toll road, say a stadium, say revenues that are generated by an airport. Uh, one of the other interesting and complicating factors in China is there's a great deal of competition among uh, local and, and regional governments. Cities compete with each other uh, very often for the same increment of growth. And again, one of the interesting things I, I've discovered that Whereas it would be much more efficient, and much more cost effective if, say, three or four cities got together and pooled resources and constructed, say, a single airport, you see two or three airports that are built in each, each little city. There's a, there's a lot of airports in China that one might question whether it actually needs all the airports. Same thing with stadiums. Everybody wants to have a stadium. I don't want to use the stadium in the next city over because it has their name on it. So we'll build our own stadium. And if you're drawing basically out of the same user pool, uh, obviously you, it's probably a suboptimal solution. So, so keep that in mind when, when we get a little bit further into this. Uh, Land leasing is what everybody does. This is uh, something that was just in the Financial Times, which basically talks about the percent of local government revenues that comes from land sales. Now again, back the early parts of this decade, it was very negligible. By 2010, we're almost up to 80% of local revenue is coming from land sales. Remember I mentioned before, you only have so much land you can sell, and, and hopefully you're only selling it once. And, and in truth, it's not uh, a sale in the, the sense that we might think of uh, a fee simple title exchange where someone gives the city money and they take ownership of the land, what they get is the right to develop the land. The ownership remains with the state. So these aren't sales per se, it's, it's more of, of a long-term lease. Uh, but that has become the, the primary funding source for infrastructure. And when you're, when you're growing, when land values are going up, uh, that can be a very sensible thing to do. And I'll, I'll make a, an analogy that's uh, intended to be humorous so you can all laugh when I'm done. Uh, if you think about what we saw with the housing crisis over going back, say, five or six or ten years, we had greatly, rapidly appreciating housing values. People were taking money out of their rapidly appreciating houses, and they were using that money to buy cars, go on vacation, uh, have hair transplants. I, I didn't do that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this is all based on the fact that land values always go up. Well, what we discovered since 2008 is that that is not the case. Sometimes land values go down, and they go down very rapidly, and they go down very, very far. Uh, and if you've borrowed money, on the assumption that you were going to sell your much more valuable property, and now your much more valuable property is worth a third of what you thought, that can be a problem. This is not yet occurred in China, but there are people, myself included, who are concerned that this could, in fact, be the case, where it's basically not so much speculation, but exuberance that's causing these escalations in land value, which is one of the reasons the government has taken great pains to rein this in, which is causing some hardship uh, down the road for people who have, in fact, financed improvements using this mechanism. Uh, it's not a bad thing to do because it, it puts the public cost of the infrastructure into land values. So the people that are actually paying for the land or paying for the infrastructure, which makes the land more valuable. Th this is a very important point. This is, this is actually a good thing. 
Now we get to the not so good, which as I mentioned, the sustainability of the revenue source requires a continuous source of new land. Now, if forget about the environmental implications, but if we were adding thousands of acres off the coast by filling and dredging and adding more land, you might be able to carry that out, but that's not the case. The amount of land is essentially finite and fixed, so you can only do that for so long. The other bad thing is if your farmland is worth x yuan or dollars whatever or euros whatever denomination if if it's worth x per hectare as farmland and it's worth 20x per hectare as residential or commercial development well, gee, the, the Chinese are remarkably savvy when it comes to doing those sorts of calculations. Well, we get a lot of conversion of farmland. Uh, and at the same time, there's a lot of pressure to develop older historic areas. China is a, is a very, very old country, has uh, lovely older areas that are really the cultural heritage of the nation. Uh, and they're at great risk just because the increase of value and what you're getting are, are two things. You're, you're losing local agricultural sourcing, which is extremely important, um, unlike the U.S., where we have a very highly refined commercial agriculture sector, and which really is a global sector. Uh, most everyone in this room is too young to remember when produce actually had seasons, you know, and you ate asparagus for four weeks in the summer because that was when asparagus was grown locally. And we didn't ship then asparagus from Chile or somewhere in Africa or somewhere in Asia. But we have a very globalized food supply network which keeps everything you know, if we can't grow it here, we'll grow it somewhere else and ship it. That works very well. What I find fascinating in China is even in the very largest urbanized cities, much of the agricultural produce is in fact locally sourced. It's, it's grown very close to where it's consumed. Now, if you start to take that land out of agricultural production and put it into higher, and I'll put that in quotation marks, higher value residential or commercial use. Well, that's okay for a while, except then you start having to reach further and further to obtain what was once produced very locally. Uh, if you don't have the infrastructure to move that around, and, and again, this the, the, the global food supply network is, is very, very complicated. It's very, uh, very sophisticated. Uh, if you can't do that, you start to create situations potentially of food shortage, certainly inefficiencies in the system. Uh, and that's, that's never good. Uh, you also start to lose uh, heritage sites that are, by definition, irreplaceable. You, 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 can, you can only replace a priceless artifact zero times. You know, it exists where and what it is, and if you redevelop that, yeah, yeah I guess you can take it and move it somewhere else and create a little something, but it, it's not quite the same. And this is, this is actually quite a problem. Uh, and I'll demonstrate this. Thank, thank God for, for Google Earth. It's wonderful. This is the uh, center of Tianjin in, in 2000. And it's really hard to figure out what you're seeing there, but those little, th th those little irregularities in the surface, those are all little individual development areas, homes and whatnot. That, that's enormously dense development. You have to be on the ground to appreciate it. Uh, by 2004, you, you'll notice it's not so knobbly anymore. Uh, the square is still there. This is a different, slightly different scale. This is a square. But you notice we've... Um, The people must have gone somewhere else. Uh, the uh, development is, is no longer there. But lo and behold, by 2009, uh, we got our square back. Uh, but now we have lovely little 
developed areas. And these are much bigger buildings, I would say, certainly higher value than this, and you know, little nature areas and ponds and, and what have you. Uh, is this better than that or this better than that? I don't know. That's a value judgment. Except it's irrefutable that this is what was and this is what is. And uh, there's a great deal of concern about this. And the, uh, the residents certainly uh, do not always go along uh, harmoniously with, with this type of development. So there, there is, in fact, a large amount of uh, cultural impact. Uh, Tianjin's a, a really fascinating place, as most cities in, in China are. Uh, as you can see, it's a very, very modern city, uh, world-class seaport, a uh, highly developed area. This is a uh, river that runs through the center of town. It's all been redeveloped, high-speed rail. This is uh, the old Chinese market area, which was all leveled and rebuilt as the new old Chinese market area. Uh, that, that happens a lot in Asia, that the Chinese don't have any lock on that. Uh, there's still much going on, uh, and, and the numbers are, are always big. Uh, everything is, is big. It's like Texas. Everything's big in China. Uh, the, the numbers are fascinating. Development is still going on. This, uh, I find this interesting. The, uh, this is the old seafood street, uh, which is the old town that we had to rebuild after we tore it down uh, for other reasons. But now people realize that there is, in fact, uh, value in heritage. So a lot of these things are being reconstructed. Uh, I don't know if anyone's uh, been to, to Singapore, but the, the whole river area along uh, the Singapore River in downtown uh, is it's full of restaurants and, and shops that look like old uh, the old workhouses where you uh, little factories and you did shipping. Now, of course, that's all brand new. I mean, that's what it used to look like, but they cleaned it up and rebuilt it just as it was. So uh, that happens in lots of places, but uh, there's a lot of growth going on in Tianjin. And the question is, so uh, outside of selling off land, which is finite, uh, how, how else can you uh, finance your, your infrastructure, which I'm sure keeps some people up at night and even makes them scream. Uh, so now I want to move into some of the land-based funding mechanisms that, that we use uh, in the U.S. You uh, may have run across some of these in, in your courses. Uh, exactions, which again is a, a development fee where uh, there's a schedule for how much impact you're going to cause. Uh, on surrounding land, uh, and you put money into a fund to, to pay for that. And that can be used for capital improvements. It can be used for uh, maintenance and repair. Uh, you can also do impact fees, which are a little bit different. And that just says the developers have to install or put up money for. Uh, on-site infrastructure to support the development. This is primarily off-site impact fees are on-site, and we do that routinely. Uh, if anybody wants, and I think it may be available, the, the paper, I've got some information in there about impact fees in the US and, and what they pay for. And this is a highly developed art, and uh, one of the areas where California is a national leader. Uh, California has the highest impact and fees and exactions of any place in the country, uh, which up until uh, the real estate industry uh, went dormant, uh, some of those fees were, were very, very large in comparison to the, the cost of a house. They vary a great deal by area, but 
are quite honestly a major driver uh, in the cost of housing. Uh, one of the other things, again, that, that California does quite a bit of are, are special di districts, where property owners vote to assess themselves a tax on their property to pay for improvements. This is done all over the country. This is extremely well uh, developed in the US. But interestingly, China does not have an ad valorem property tax system. We all know what ad valorem property tax systems are? Does anybody not know? All right, so everybody knows what ad valorem property taxes are. Good, that'll be on the exam. Uh, but basically, owner, property owners vote to assess themselves. And of course, you can create these districts administratively. You can draw lines around them. We, we do it by, by referendum at the ballot box, but there's no reason why uh, areas can't be designated as special improvements, which uh, again can generate a great deal of money for particular services. Now, when you're getting new development or redevelopment or new development on existing areas, uh, because the development business spins off a great deal of excess cash, uh, you can generally pay for that. The, the problem becomes if you have existing areas that need services and you're not going to redevelop, how do you approach the problem? It's fundamentally different. You can't get the, the new residents of a very expensive apartment blocks or new owners of commercial offices to pay for this, uh, how do you work within the existing framework? Uh, this is one way, but it's made much more difficult, again, because of the absence of uh, a graduated ad valorem type system where property that's more valuable pays more and allegedly gets more benefit. That goes back to the efficiency point uh, we saw a couple of slides ago that said uh, using land uh, is economically efficient because you, you capitalize that in the price. And, and this is really just an example uh, that's uh, not being done at the moment. Uh, some other areas that uh, have been, uh, some of these have been pioneered, again, uh, tax increment financing. California, again, was the first state to do this. Uh, and if I'm going over stuff you know, that's too bad. Uh, basically, uh, you use public money to provide infrastructure on the premise that you'll increase the value of the land, uh, which now will spin off more tax than it did in its previous state. And you'll use that increment between the prior and the post, yes. I, would you please speak a little louder because I don't hear well. Well, I don't know the I don't know that what's going on in California has particularly very much to do with whether tax increment financing works or not. The, the problem with what's going on in California, it's being used to eliminate short-term expenditures to achieve balance in the budget. It's not saying tax increment financing doesn't work. Uh, quite honestly, tax increment financing sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. It doesn't always work as it spins out. There are ways you can do this, I think, that make a great deal of sense. Uh, it tends to get overused and it tends to get oversold. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I was recommending any of these things. I was putting out, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that can be tried. And, and much of this, uh, you know, 
has worked in places in the U.S. And, and TIFFs, uh, you know, depending on whose stuff you read, but I think overall there, there's a pretty positive record. You know, redevelopment agencies get into a whole other sidebar issue. And to get back to the direct answer to the, the question, I think in California it's got much more to do with budget problems than it does with the efficiency of that particular mechanism. Uh, this is potentially huge given the fact that, that China is building so much transportation infrastructure. Uh, and you know, obviously if you run a urban transit line or you run a high speed rail line or you build a high speed limited access motorway, you create a lot of value in the adjacent land. I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty simple. Even I get that. Uh, one of the things we haven't done particularly well uh, as a nation, I mean, it's been spotty. Some places have done much better. Some places uh, have done much worse, is to recognize that that land is going to go up in value and extract from the people that are going to benefit. The, the private sector. Obviously, if you own property near the interchange of an urban freeway or if you own property that's adjacent to a stop on an urban transit line, uh, your land is going to increase in value. Uh, how does the public sector capture some of that value to, in fact, uh, support both the development and the maintenance and repair uh, of infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot more that can be done with this. It raises a lot of issues about density and growth control. Uh, local example, I think Pasadena is a wonderful one. They've done a, a, a really quite a good job uh, with that. The uh, downturn uh, has slowed that down. But, but they, they did this pretty well. Uh, and then how do you get the private sector involved through a whole range of uh, programs called public-private partnerships, which, again, that's uh, another lecture in and of itself. But the fact that the private sector contractually agrees to do certain things, provide certain services and facilities that the public sector typically does in exchange uh, for a fee, and the public sector gets the facilities that provide the services, which ostensibly is what it's all about. The private sector makes money. The private sector has a great deal of capital uh, to bring to this. Uh, although, interestingly, PPPs have not uh, been used as aggressively in China as you might think. And my, my own view on this is that I think this has got a lot to do with uh, the state control of, of many, still of many of the, the operations uh, in the infrastructure business. Uh, some others, uh, and I, I actually put these in uh, yuan and, and dollars, so it could be a, a joint presentation. Th these are purely US examples. This is uh, the Highway Trust Fund, which uh, now, now China does have a tax on fuel, but it is not uh, dedicated, as I understand per se, just to transportation. It's a, it's a tax on fuel that goes into general revenue. Uh, our highway trust fund generates $35 billion a year annually, or about. Uh, our large uh, commercial airports uh, charge fees, which are, go into the price of every ticket. Uh, that spins off about two and a half billion dollars, much less obviously. Uh, there was a proposal to put a fees, fee on shipping containers uh, here in California, mainly aimed at the ports of Long Beach and LA. Uh, Thirty dollars per container uh, was going to generate significant money for infrastructure, but that, uh, that was actually vetoed by the, the former governor. Uh, and then again, something that California has 
if not pioneering, uh, California has certainly embraced the uh, targeted sales taxes, the uh, self-help county, if you will, where uh, Measure R in LA is part of this, where the people vote to increase sales taxes uh, to pay for specific infrastructure. Uh, $4.2 billion annually, that is uh, larger than what the state is currently spending uh, on transportation infrastructure. And uh, certainly this type of tax could be implemented again. I mean, these are, this is what's done in the US. This is something I think that could potentially uh, have a lot of impact in, in a country like China, primarily because they don't have uh, a, a ad valorem uh, property tax in place. Uh, if we talk about the options for you know, funding infrastructure, we just saw some mechanisms. Uh, there's really only two ways. You, you pay for the public sector pays for anything or gets the money. They either have taxes or they, they charge fees. And we tend to look at taxes to provide public goods and fees to provide things more market commodity based on consumption. Uh, we, in the US, we generally accept this, except where it comes to transportation, highway transportation in particular, we expect that to be free. Uh, but the simple fact is, if you don't want to use taxes to pay for infrastructure, you need to charge fees. I mean, there's this trade-off of, you know, is something a fee, is it a tax? But uh, we're basically going to have to do both here, and I think both could, in fact, work uh, in China. Uh, financing of infrastructure, and I, I hope you understand the difference. Funding infrastructure is, is where the, the money comes from, the, the, the taxes versus the fees. The financing is how do you apply the money? Do you uh, basically save up and, and wait until you have enough to do something? Do you go out and take some of what you have and do you borrow the rest? Much like we buy homes. Uh, if you had to wait until you had three, four, five hundred thousand dollars accumulated to buy a house, you'd probably be very old by the time you bought one and then wouldn't need one anymore. So uh, we tend to do that uh, through debt as opposed to pay as you go, where you borrow the money, and that's all really bonds are is a formal way of borrowing money. Uh, you can do what's been the practice in the US for a long time, which is intergovernmental transfers. The Federal government collects money from the country as a whole and redistributes it based on a number of formulas. Uh, you sort of have this in China, unfortunately, or unfortunately for the cities, uh, you've got the money collected at the local level and then it runs up to the, the national level as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and of course you can have private sector participation through uh, various forms of PPPs. Uh, we're hearing a lot because of the uh, primaries that are going on about uh, how the, the government, and I guess it's, it's only the, the current administration, all, all, all time started with the Obama administration, I suppose, uh, that we're, we're burdening our grandchildren with uh, all our debts to, to pay for things. You know, we shouldn't borrow money to build infrastructure because we're going to burden our grandchildren with the cost because you pay these things off over a long period of time. Of course, if you think about it, why shouldn't the grandchildren pay for infrastructure? They're going to be using it. You know, infrastructure lasts for 50, 75 years, so probably the grandchildren's grandchildren will be using it. So it's, uh, it really does uh, take out this issue of generational equity. Uh, the other problems with pay-as-you-go and not borrowing is that if you only use current revenues, there's only so much you can do because in any given year you only collect so much money. Uh, so 
these two go together. It, it'd be nice if we could pay cash, but because we can't, uh, we borrow money, and you actually leverage what you can do, which leads to the third. This makes sense. Uh, at the end of the day, we do a lot of small projects with current funds, which China does, and, and debt financing. And you know, going back to the initial part of the presentation, there's nothing wrong with using debt financing. It's just there's questions about the way China has structured its borrowing for infrastructure could, in fact, cause some problems. Uh, and this really centers around sort of a moral hazard situation where people, moral hazard is just where people take actions that they might not ordinarily do if they didn't have to bear the full consequences of the action. Um, and it's sort of like me gambling with your money. I might be a lot bolder in my gambles because it's not my money. Uh, and the question here is because of this unique situation where the Chinese banks, for the most part, are state-owned. So you've got government involvement in the banking industry, and there's really uh, four major uh, banks in China. Uh, remember I talked about these urban and development investment corporations. Uh, they issue bonds which are secured by land assets or even more hazardous uh, projected cash flows of revenue producing projects. Now again, remember airports will generate cash and how much depends of course on how much traffic and if you've got one airport that's reasonably sized to serve the population uh, you know the numbers will probably pencil out at some level but now if we have three airports remember I talked about we have a lot of competition and everyone wants their own uh, so if we have three airports where now all of them are operating at about one-third efficiency can they really pay back three times the debt with one-third the revenue? The answer is no. If, if the, I know you had lunch, so you may not be thinking uh, quickly. But the fact is, having essentially less money to pay back more debt, uh, that doesn't work real well. So that's a problem. Uh, now, now we start to get into really interesting cases that the, these urban development <coughs> investment corporations are generally managed by the municipal administration of the city. So you've got the same people wearing two hats. So on the municipal side, oh gee, we really want to build a stadium. So we'll set up one of these UDICs and we'll borrow money to annex land to build a stadium um, and we'll pay it back by the increased value in the real estate. Now, if these folks were totally separate, cut off from this, and the municipality came to them and said, we want to build this 100,000 seat football stadium because, you know, China's going to be world class soccer team and, and it's all going to center right here in our little particular town. Uh, now, if this was a much more objective investment group, they might look around and notice that there were four other 100,000-seat football stadiums within 100 kilometers, and we really didn't need another one. So, no, we don't think we'll give you the money. Uh, but all too often that doesn't happen, and the question is, you know, are these folks can they really be objective given the rules of the game under which they operate? And, and that's, that's really questionable. Uh, at the end of the day, the situation is not terribly transparent, and that would be very, very helpful uh, because uh, a lot of concern. Uh, these are press clippings from oh, about six months ago, right up until uh, fairly recently, 
where we've uh, started to see, because of government action, the, to their credit, the national leadership uh, has seen that there was a very large bubble forming in property values. Uh, so they started to rein this in. Uh, so that starts to wobble, but then we have a decline in property sales, which you know, raises some questions. If we're not going to keep selling property, where are we going to get the money to pay off uh, the loans we've already taken off? So, well, then we start to get the issue, well, just roll over the loan. You know, the loan comes due, just roll it over for a few more years. You know, that would be nice to do with uh, mortgage payments or car payments when you can't make them. I'll just roll it over. You know, so call me next month and I'll, I'll, I'll write you a check then. Uh, and then at the same time, there's talk about letting local governments issue bonds, giving them more authority to do that. Unfortunately, uh, there is no rating group in China similar to Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch's so that you can go look and see, oh, the you know, Shanghai sanitation authorities are rated double A by an entity that we believe. Uh, right now, most Chinese debt that's issued is rated by a Chinese government agency. Again, uh, you, you question the objectivity of, of, the, of, of the rater. So this might be good to let local governments issue debt, but only if people who are going to be buying the debt, and certainly a question I'd ask if I was going to put my money into this, uh, well, how likely am I to get my money back? Which, you know, is, is a fair question. So uh, a lot of issues over the whole let's use land to fund infrastructure. Uh, as we wind down here, some, some thoughts I had about what China might want to consider. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of interest in Yuan denominated bonds. A lot of people want to invest in China in the local currency. The infrastructure bond market is not well developed as such. And uh, China made enormous leaps forward when they adopted uh, Western style stock exchanges, getting Chinese companies listed on the New York and Hong Kong stock exchanges was an enormous boost to those corporations. Uh, that's probably something that ought to be considered. Could they do something analogous in the infrastructure bond market? Uh, coming up with, in fact, sustainable sources of tax revenue, the whole idea behind ad valorem taxes is that it's paid every year based on the value of the property. It's not a one-time transfer tax, which is basically what the system is now. This would continue to spin off money that can be used for maintenance and repair long-term obligations. Uh, user fees, now this can be problematic uh, in a country like China, which still has a great deal of uh, economic inequality. There's still a lot of people who are not well off. As a result, a lot of these services are heavily subsidized by the government. The, uh, if I recall, and even if I'm wrong on this, it's not going to be much, the, the high-speed rail between Beijing and Tianjin, I think the trip's about 150 kilometers, and you go 180 miles an hour and, and pay, I think, under $10 for the ticket. Now, the trains are always full. I, but even so, I'm not sure that that covers the cost. Uh, maybe it covers the cost of operation. It certainly didn't cover the cost of construction. Uh, over time, user fees need to start to produce revenues to actually fund maintenance and repair of the system. And, and this, 
This is not just in China. I mean, it'd be nice if we did the same thing in the US, which we don't. But uh, it's very difficult to actually adjust user fees to capture the full cost. You, you know, transit systems, you can't capture the full cost at the fare box because then nobody would use it. It would be too expensive. But uh, these are you know, things that could be done. There's certainly more. I, I talk about that in the paper. Uh, right now, China is very, very healthy financially. Uh, many of their systems are new. They, uh, and I, I've raised this issue before in China and was told that, well, we, we have a lot of money. We don't have to worry about that. But then I always point them to an old Chinese proverb where you always ought to dig the well before you get thirsty. Uh, so I do want to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll take any questions. <laughs> So one of the things you suggested was adding or creating an ad war on property taxes. I know that there are a few municipalities that have done so in China, like very on a very limited basis. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that if if none of the transfers between a municipality and the developers are a fee simple interest, it's just a ground lease or, or a development right. I mean, eventually, uh, the value just you know goes get shrinks. So if I sold you a hundred year lease for you know a couple acres or whatever it is you know it's worth 100 million now but it's going to go down over time so if because the lease will expire and you'll have to vacate so the or how would that how would it, it well, you can i mean you can always renegotiate the lease and, and roll it over well i mean that's true but in i mean it seems like you there would be there still would be some difficulty there of collecting property taxes if the base was always shrinking well, it's, uh, you know, but there's going to be transfers along the line. I mean, property does exchange. One of the other problems right now with implementing that is that there's really very little secondary real estate market. You know, you go to the developer and buy an apartment, and most of what we're talking about is, you know, apartments as opposed to single-family homes. You know, a lot of Chinese have bought apartments and never finish them because apparently the way you buy an apartment in China is you get a shell. It's, you know, you don't get the cherry cabinets and the appliances or the commode or the sink. You get a shell and, you know, you do, you finish the bath and you finish the kitchen and all this. Uh, but some people buy three, four or five of these and just hold them. They don't have any intention of living in them. It's, in many ways, it's kind of like buying gold. You know, the expectation is, well, I bought here today in five years, it'll be up here, and I will have made a lot of money. So there's not a lot of, it's not a robust transfer market like in better times we have where people, you know, buy a house, they live there for three years, they move up, they sell it to the next person. So even if they, if they had the secondary market develop, even under the situation you describe, there would still be churn, that the, the property would still have value. Ultimately, you know, I don't know exactly how to solve the decreasing value of the lease as you approach its term, but from my perspective, it's the potential to generate a lot of revenue is certainly there. They don't do it at all. So, th so that's, that's just off the table. Is it, the, you know, is it the, the best or optimal solution? I don't know, but it's a, when you look at how the U.S. has financed itself for a long time, and we've certainly provided a lot of stuff, and I'm not going to hold us up as the perfect model in everything. We've done a lot with ad valorem taxes. Sure, but we have these simple. So yeah, well, it's, uh, but there, there are other land systems which have also, uh, you know, I'm, again, I, I know this more peripherally in, in doing research, but, you know, getting into the, you know, the Spanish land system versus, the U.S., the English land system. I mean, it's, really, it's pretty bizarre how people have handled land uh, through time. But, you know, taxing the value of land is uh, not a bad thing to do. And, and I think they could, there's certainly ways you, I'm sure they could develop a Chinese model that worked. Has there been discussion at all of using their amounts of liquidity 
right now to develop sort of a, a revolving fund, not unlike what we have with TIFIA and other types of similar programs? Well, uh, going back very early on, uh, the short answer is no. I mean, oh, I'm sure there have been discussions, but they didn't invite me, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, but from what I've been able to glean from the, the literature, that uh, the central government, which is where you know, the, these huge surpluses are held, I mean, they have pushed this down to the local level, which has caused really that moral hazard between the UDICs and the city governments. I mean, that's, that's the nature of the problem, that these people are tasked with providing very expensive stuff with very few options to pay for it, you know, which is kind of one of the reasons why these bank loans keep rolling over and nobody starts to, nobody stops the music, if you will, and say, okay, the loans do pay up, which of course is when you generally get crashes in speculative markets when somebody actually expects to get paid. And, and so if you keep, if you keep churning, it, it's okay. And, and there's, there's been real concern. I mean, there's, uh, there's been a lot written about what happens, you know, if this bu bubble bursts. And you can, you can come up with some pretty scary stuff, given the fact that there's a lot of debt for infrastructure out there that will probably never be paid. And if it all comes due at once, and this is a good thing, with, Chinese, with China not having a terribly open economy. You know, imagine if this debt was held across the globe in you know, commercial purposes and all of a sudden they've got to make do. Uh, all that liquidity you mentioned uh, might start running out of the country to pay off these loans, which again, I love doomsday scenarios. You know, imagine selling off several hundred billion dollars in US treasuries over the next year and a half. You know, that could probably have some impact on world financial markets. So, I mean, people, people are keeping a, a very careful eye on China. I mean, I, you know, this is one little tiny piece of this issue, but uh, it is, in fact, a, a major issue that, that people are concerned about. You know, you mentioned value add as a possible uh, solution. You know, it's very interesting to me because the Hong Kong Railway, the, the metro system in Hong Kong, uses that almost exclusively to fund their extensions and operations. So there's like a, you know, an example in their back door. So it's surprising to me that that isn't widely used in China today. They've just, uh, somewhere in the paper, there's like one example that I found where they actually did that. You know, it basically took that whole Chinese model and and used it, and, but it's, you're right, I mean, Hong Kong, that's what they've done, but of course, up until fairly recently, you had a whole different system in place as, as to how it was, was operating, but it's, uh, the folks that have had their, their hands on the, the levers of the economy there, have, uh, they've really done kind of a masterful job for all the, you know, nitpicking you can do about this doesn't work and that doesn't work, it's, uh, they've had the benefit of generating enormous surpluses. I think certainly my concern in this business and the, the people who get paid to think about much bigger concerns is what happens 20 years down the road? You know, that, that there's lots of, there's demographics at play, there's finances at play, there's shipping work off to Cambodia and Vietnam at play. You know, and again, China's still very much a developing country, you know, even though you can go to places like Beijing and Shanghai that are world class in some of the things that we see, but there's a lot out in the, the western hinterlands that there's a lot that still needs to be done, and I'm sure it, uh, going back to my little munch picture there, uh, you know, that must keep people up at, uh, at night. Okay, well, thank you all and uh, appreciate your coming.